Hello, and welcome to our program, Strategies to Reduce Morbidity and Mortality in COPD, a patient-focused approach for integration of combination and triple therapy. My name is Melan Hahn, and I'm a professor of pulmonary medicine at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And I'm excited to be joined today by my colleague, uh, Dr. Ramon Reyes, medical director at Bandera uh, Health, sorry about that guys, care located in San Antonio, Texas. Our faculty disclosures are displayed on the screen. Our program tonight will cover the latest information on approaches to care and treatment of COPD. During the program, be sure to comment below and let us know where you're watching from. If you uh, haven't done so already, please complete the pretest at www.integrasite.com forward slash COPD pretest three. So over the course of today's discussion, we'll be addressing the following learning objectives. Describe updated criteria for the diagnosis of COPD to enable early recognition and improved assessment of disease severity. Review updated guidelines and recommendations for the use of combination bronchodilator therapy to optimize treatment and management of COPD and identify strategies like pulmonary rehabilitation and triple therapy combinations for specific patient subsets to reduce morbidity and mortality. So we've got a lot to cover tonight. We're going to just you know jump right in uh, to talking about COPD burden and unmet needs. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Reyes. Thank you. Next slide. As you can see, the COPD is very prevalent in the United States in adults and people older than 18. It can be as low as 2 to 4%, but it can be as high as almost 10% average in some of the states in the Ohio Valley, in the Midwestern, in the South, and some of the states in the East. And as you can see, the COPD cost is a big burden. Uh, in, in, 20, in, in 2010, there was $32.1 billion in cost on COPD. And if you, as you can see, in 2020, it has gone up to $49 billion. So it's a very expensive disease. And most of this cost is met by the Medicare and Medicaid insurance, very little by the private insurance. It also impacts absenteeism at 3.9 billion on, on absenteeism and 6.4 million days of work loss. So absenteeism is a big issue on COPD. And obviously there is people missing work from COPD. And COPD is often diagnosed late in the disease process, unfortunately. In a study that was done in 2010, they found a high prevalence of previously undiagnosed COPD in patients that were presenting to the hospital for the first time with acute exacerbations. And these patients that are being admitted to the hospital for the first time with an exacerbation of COPD have a disease that was as severe and symptomatic as patients that were previously diagnosed. And unfortunately, if we're not diagnosing these patients in a timely manner, we cannot offer appropriate interventions that can be effective, that can hopefully can avoid some of these hospital admissions. And how good are we with spirometry in the United States? As you can see in this study on 1999, 51% of the patients said that they had a spirometry done within the first year of diagnosis. So that's still half of the patients are not having spirometry. And in 2008, we're a little bit better. We have gone up to 58, but still, you know, there's 40% of people that are not having spirometry once they're diagnosed within the first year, unfortunately. So who are the patients that are more associated, more likely to get spirometry? People that are young age, males, white race, 
high socioeconomic status and high number of comorbids. If you look this in the other side, the people that are minority groups and people from lower economic status are not getting diagnosed in a timely manner. So what is the perception that we as providers have in how good we're doing with managing of COPD and assessing COPD and how do that compare with the patient? So when you're looking at, as we as providers are asking the symptoms to patients when they're coming to the clinics, as you can see in primary care, that to say that if we rarely or never do it, the 80% of the primary care physicians are saying that they are, you know, rarely doing that. So they're most of the time asking, the pulmonologists rarely are doing it. They're always asking their patients. But if you look at the patients on the other side, the patients are saying that rarely or never they're being asked their symptoms. If you look at, you know, how often we do spirometries on patients with COPD, we as doctors say and pray that we're doing it in 80% of the time. The patients are saying that it's being done around 91% of the time. So if you're trying to say, are we uh, asking the patients, are they experiencing exacerbations that are requiring admissions to the hospital or more than two? Are we asking that as providers to the patient? We're saying that only 33% of the time we're doing that. And 56% of the time, the patients are saying that we're asking them about exacerbation. If you look at adherence to medicine, there's a discrepancy here too. We believe that most of the patients are not using their medicines because of medication costs. But for the patients, the reality is that now is not so much medication, is that the patients are forgetting the use of their medicines. So how are we doing with COPD diagnosis? So what are the key indicators that we in primary care and pulmonology should have to diagnose COPD? What are the goal guidelines? What are the suggestions? And, and what they're saying on a patient that is older than 40, that is presenting with any of these other symptoms in the board, we should be very suspicious that this patient older than 40 may have a COPD, especially if they have multiple of these factors. So the more of these factors a patient has, and a patient that is older than 40, the more suspicious we should be in primary care and as pulmonologists that this patient may be having COPD. So one of the most common signs is this here. So that is progressing over time, that is worse with exertion and is persistent. The other one that is very common in primary care, and we tend to miss it, is chronic cough. A patient that is having a chronic cough and is older than 40, we should be suspicious. This patient may have COPD, especially if there are other factors. If that cough is a productive cough, it's a very subjective issue that it may be COPD. And what risk factors in the host may suggest you that this patient has COPD? In primary care, we should always suspect that a patient that is coughing and has a history of smoking is COPD until proven otherwise. Obviously, there's genetic conditions. Always there is, you know, fume exposures at home. There is occupational exposures. But the history of smoking is very, very important. And for us in primary care, we need to know that there's other risk factors, family history, it may be an issue, low birth weights may be an issue, and a lot of history of recurrent childhood respiratory infections may put those patients at risk for COPD. So what are the, what are the, the pathway to make this diagnosis? How do we do it? Obviously, as we said before, symptoms. Symptoms are very important, and we have them there, shortness of breath, chronic cough, sputum production. In the context of risk factors, 
smokers, a history of genetic issues, family history, a childhood exposures, lower work or occupation. Somebody that is telling you I work and I'm exposed to fumes, and indoor and outdoor pollution may be a risk factor. So if you put those two together, it should say to you, this patient probably has COPD and you should, and you have to, and we should as primary care physicians order a spirometry because spirometry is required for the diagnosis of COPD. So how do we assess these patients that are presenting with COPD? We already know they have COPD. So how do we decide to treat them? In the old days, we would look at the P of T and try to make all the decisions based on P of T, either the FEV1 and FEVC ratio or the FEVC predictive percentage. But really what we want to do as primary care physicians is ask the patients of symptoms. Are you having symptoms? Are you having shortness of breath? And is that shortness of breath significant? And use an MMRC questionnaire for that. And then also have to ask the patients, you're telling me you're coughing. Are you exacerbating yourself? Because the more symptoms the patient has, the more exacerbations the patient has, then you have to move that patient from an A or a C to a B or a D. So many, you know, many exacerbations, admissions to the hospital, or a patient with a very high MMRC or a very high CAT score that suggests this patient is very symptomatic, this patient has a lot of exacerbations, then you go to B or, or D to treat the patient. If the patient is otherwise, then you treat them based on A or based on C. So the treatment is guided based on symptoms and history of exacerbations. So what are the challenges that we have to diagnose based on spirometry? So as, a, as you probably know, and we have discussed, spirometry is highly underutilized. So it's reported that it's being un underused, probably because we, we don't have access to, to long function labs, as some of us in primary care don't have PFTs in our office. So the question is, where do I send my patients to get that spirometry? So access is an issue. In a 28 study, it was reported that 56% of patients with a doctor diagnosis of COPD had a spirometry percent in their lifetime. So there's still around 40% of people that are not getting spirometry. And unfortunately, when spirometry is performed on this, 56% of patients, the spirometry patterns that we're seeing are not concordant with the disease. So they're not exactly good spirometry, so are not being read correctly. So we're under-diagnosing or misdiagnosing patients even when we're doing spirometries. Next slide. So for us in primary care, how accurate is to diagnose a patient with COPD without spirometry. So if you have in this context of smoking history, previous history of respiratory disease, you have patients that keep coming to the clinic with, with bronchitis and allergies and sinusitis. You check them in, your, in the lungs, their sounds are abnormal. You hear decreased breath sounds, they're wheezing, they have a lot of ronca and they have prolonged expiratory phase, this is by exam, then in this patient, there is a very highly likely possibility clinically that the patient has COPD. But even in these patients, we're gonna still make some patients if we're only using clinical impression. So clinical impression should not be the only way for us to be diagnosing COPD patients. So Dr. Han, what are your thoughts on these issues that I have presented and on the COPD situation? You've brought up a lot of things that we're really struggling with. I, I think that uh, we had challenges before the pandemic 
And now with the pandemic, everything is harder. Getting pulmonary function testing is harder. Getting, uh, you know, teaching patients how to use their inhalers. Everything uh, about uh, CPD, unfortunately, has has gotten harder. I think, you know, for me in my clinic, I'm a, a lung doctor, so all of my patients are getting spirometry the moment they walk in. But there are so many patients out there uh, who are, are not getting appropriately diagnosed. And I've been, I have to be honest, I've been a little bit shocked at, for instance, how severe some patients are um, at just by the time they get their, their first visit with me. So, so we clearly, I think, have some, you know, work to do and, and investigators, including myself, have looked at you know, do we need to be implement, implementing system-wide screeners to try to identify you know which patients should be uh, should undergo spirometry, but but I, I don't think there's one universal solution. Are, are there specific things you're doing in your practice? You know, you know, I agree with you. you know, I have a I'm the medical director of a primary care group, and we have an urgent care and we have advanced practitioners. So the level of knowledge is is different as you can expect, and I you know I can still see that we have a lot of people that are presenting with respiratory diseases and we're treating them for other stuff. You know, we're treating them for bronchitis, we're treating them for allergies, we're treating them for sinusitis. And unfortunately, some of these patients have risk factors. They have been smoking in the past. And we are not, you know, I believe that we in primary care and in urgent cares and ERs, we have to do a better job diagnosing these patients early because unfortunately by the time that they get to you in your office like i show in the other slide by the time that they get admitted to the hospital their disease is already severe so we're missing six seven years of the disease because we and I'm, I'm going to say us i don't want to blame you guys but us in primary care are not identifying the people early enough and in the urgent cares and in the emergency room, in the same situation. So, and I agree with you now that the that you, the, the pulmonary, you know, consultants are so consumed with hospital work, we cannot send patients to you guys to do, you know, confirmatory PFT with with diffusion capacity. But I hope that every primary care physician that is listening to this will go home and go to their practice, and if they don't have spirometry like you're doing in your office, and I'm trying to do in mine, everybody that comes that has is older than 40 and has risk factors should be screened for with a spirometry. Okay, could we, uh, let's go ahead and get moving to the next uh, portion of the uh, program to really dig specifically uh, in on COPD treatment. Uh, so there's a lot of things we can do, um, both from the pharmacologic side and the non-pharmacologic. So, um, you know, I think one of the cornerstones for COPD care has been, will always be smoking and vaping cessation. Vaccinations are now more important than ever. So right now, flu season, um, that's a big one. Pneumonia vaccines are also important for uh, patients with COPD. COVID vaccines and now boosters um, are, are also incredibly uh, important. The, the CDC has now recently um, suggested that, for instance, flu and COVID vaccines can be given at the same time. So that's, I think, an important update, particularly as we head into fall. Exercise is also really important for our patients with COPD, particularly pulmonary rehabilitation. Again, this has been a challenge uh, during the, the pandemic, but um, you know, some some places are looking towards virtual solutions. Uh, I'm lucky my pulmonary rehab program here at Michigan's back open, but I know all of us uh, from a health system perspective are really grappling with how to, to handle this. And then thinking about pharmacologic treatment and which medications to use when and in whom. So we're gonna talk about a little bit about that tonight if you wanna go to, to the next slide. So uh, gold, breaks people down into uh, a, the ABCD categories, and that's based on symptoms and risk for exacerbations. So individuals with low symptoms are in the A and C group, high symptoms are in the B and D group, 
and then it's your C and D patients that are at higher risk for exacerbations. So for, for that kind of milder patient on top of smoking cessation and physical activity, again, we think about the flu and the pneumococcal vaccines. Uh, similar for our, our B through D patients, but these are also patients where perhaps you want to add in that formal uh, pulmonary rehabilitation program. Here in the United States, uh, the uh, CMS has given a national coverage determination for COPD, and essentially anyone with airflow obstruction uh, who has an FEV1 of 80% or, or less should qualify. There are some local guidances that might alter that, but but in general, that's sort of where the, the national determination coverage sits. If we can go to the next slide. So what does GOLD recommend in terms of uh, pharmacologic therapy? And here again, we, we break these into the low symptom, high symptom, low risk, high risk groups, and that's uh, you can identify where your patient is in that based on MMRC, which is a dyspnea score, the CPD assessment test, uh, both easily available online, and then risk based on prior exacerbations, zero to one moderate with no severe, putting you in the low risk group, two or more moderate or one or more severe, putting you in the high risk group. So, so what are the recommended medications? Group A, bronchodilator, that may, may even just be albuterol for some people. More persistent symptoms, long-acting bronchodilator. That, that could be a LABA or LAMA. Um, if you actually read the text in the gold document, they do mention LAMA-LABA as well uh, as another option, particularly for patients with severe dyspnea. Group C, LAMA. And group D, here's where we have a lot of options. That might be LAMA. It might be a LAMA and a LABA, so dual bronchodilator, um, for, uh, particularly, again, if highly symptomatic. If patients have really high EOs, you may want to start with an inhaled corticosteroid lava combination. And here, the suggested threshold to use would be 300. If we can move to the next slide. Once you've got the initial treatment regimen chosen, when the patient comes back to the office, this is when you pivot to this table, which is also in the gold document. And there's two pathways. If your concern is my patient is really short of breath, you follow, the, follow the, the dyspnea pathway. If your concern is my patient's having a lot of exacerbations despite what I'm doing, you follow the exacerbation pathway. Um, and you can just kind of follow along there to see how it ramps up. For shortness of breath, we add on the bronchodilators, potentially consider inhaled corticosteroids um, in certain patients. But you know, other things to think about, are they using the device correctly? Or is there, am I missing something like heart failure or pulmonary hypertension? For exacerbations, for patients with high, higher levels of eosinophils, you may want to think about even uh, going to uh, a lava ICS combination. If not, you may consider up, upgrading from a single bronchodilator to a dual. If you're still having issues for this patient and they have EOs over 100 or more, you can consider triple therapy. Other things to think about that you could consider adding on to triple therapy might be azithromycin in some patients or even uh, reflumolast, which is indicated in patients who have chronic bronchitis and an FEV1 under 50% predicted. So these are just some kind of just general outlines of how to think about progression based on the goals of treatment. If we can move to the next slide. So the American Thoracic Society also recently came out with some uh, guidelines and they really, the goal of this document was really to just address some very, very specific questions. And so I wanna go through that with you and then talk to you about how I, I sort of rectify the two documents in my own mind. So they made a strong combination, a strong recommendation to prescribe combination LABA and LAMA therapy. So dual bronchodilator therapy rather than LABA or LAMA monotherapy for patients with dyspnea or exercise intolerance. So that, that does differ just a tad from um, the goal document. And then they made some conditional recommendations, including inhaled corticosteroids for patients with dyspnea or exercise intolerance if they're already on a LABA-LAMA combination and they've had at least one severe exacerbation in the prior year to discontinue inhaled steroids for patients on triple therapy if they've not had an exacerbation in the past year, 
And then uh, also they came out kind of strongly stating that oral steroids are not recommended for frequent and severe exac um, <clears throat> exacerbations while on optimal therapy. So no maintenance uh, oral steroids. If we can go to the next. Uh... So this is just some interesting uh, data to uh, you know show you sort of uh, what the relative efficacy is for combination lava llama therapy versus lava or llama therapy alone in patients not receiving inhaled corticosteroids. So this is data from something called the EMAX trial. Um, and in this study, combination therapy consistently provided sustained improve, improvement in breathlessness and daily symptoms and reduced risk of lung deterioration versus um, the individual components. And so you can see here the, the the, the dual bronchodilator is in blue and the singles are in uh, green and in orange. And, and you can see whether it's breathlessness, whether it's daily symptom score or whether um, it's rescue free days that the blue um, tended to be best ac almost across every single one of these graphs. And it the data suggests a potential for early use of dual bronchodilators in patients not receiving inhaled corticosteroids, particularly um, at low uh, risk for um, uh, exacerbations. So I'm going to go ahead, I believe, and uh, turn things over to Dr. Reyes. So, so what are the approved long-acting bronchodilators that are in monotherapy for the patients that Dr. Han that you were discussing before? If we do only monotherapy, here are the larvas. You know, I know that in primary care, we know more the brand names. You know, the brand names are there for use. The llamas, you know, if you use single llamas, those are the llamas that we have. If we're going to use long-acting bronchodilators or monotherapies, these are the options, and these are the, deli the different delivery systems. Next. So what about if we're going to do combination therapy? Like Dr. Han, you were talking about combination therapy for the people that are more symptomatic or combination therapy for people that are having significant exacerbations. So this is the options that we have to use for Lama Lava. These are the branded name products that we have. We have three products that are good on that combination. Those are the dual bronchodilators or the Lava ICS that has been in the market for, for longer. These are the ones that we have and the different delivery systems. And obviously now we have the advantage, like Dr. Ham was saying, that in some specific patients, we may have to consider using triple therapy and that has lava, lama, and ICS. So the three medications in one. And these are the options. We have trilogy and breast tree that are both, you know, approved and indicated. And the advantage is one is a DPI and the other one is an MDI. Next. So what are the factors like Dr. Gan, you were mentioning that we should consider to use in hair corticosteroids on patients? I know that in the old days, every COPD patient was in corticosteroids, but now the guidelines are saying so you should look into this a little bit better. So if the patient has a history of one or two, you know, you know, if they excuse me, if the patient has a history of hospitalization for exacerbations of COPD, two moderate exacerbations per year for COPD, their eosinophils are higher than 300, or they have concomitant asthma, those are the patients that we should consider using ICS on the, on the treatment, either lava ICS or triple therapy. So in which patients you may use them, but there's no strong support to do that. It's if their patients are having less exacerbations per year, only one per year. If the patient has eosinophils that are borderline between 100 and 300 in the blood, then that patient may benefit from it. So who should not, you should not be considering using ICS. People that have repeated pneumonias in the past, we should not probably be using ICS because some of these patients, the ICS may cause pneumonias. 
Patients that have very low eosinophils don't respond very well to inhaled corticosteroids below 100, and obviously people that have microbacterial infections. Next. So Dr. Han, uh, let's hear about, in your opinion, you know, with this you know, discussion, what is your thought on which medication should we be using for these patients with COPD? Yeah, there's, you know, we've talked about a lot here and there's really so much to consider. I, I, you know, in my practice, I will often, I will start with either a single or a dual bronchodilator. And I think, you know, I think the difference between the ATS and the gold recommendation is really just sort of nuance. Um, and if you have a patient that's perhaps a little higher risk or has more severe symptoms, I'll lean towards the, the dual bronchodilator. And then when I start having, when those patients start having frequent exacerbations, I, I do look at the eosinophil count. And, and if it is, you know, ranging above 100, I'll, I'll often just go ahead and try adding the inhaled corticosteroids. And then when my patients fail there, uh, or if, the, you know, if that's not enough, then I, then I do start thinking about um, either azithromycin or riflumilast. And, and for that, there are a couple of subtle factors that'll push me more, more towards one or the other. For riflumilast, patients really need to have chronic bronchitis. Um, so if, if they don't have that, maybe that'll push me to azithromycin. Um, so, so there's just, a, I think, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things to, to think about. Are, I'm curious, are you using eosinophils to help guide uh, inhaled steroid therapy in your practice? Yes, 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 we do. You know, we have it as a, as a gap of care on patients with COPD and asthma. So, and we're, we have, you know, the machine in the office to do eosinophil count. And we also do it for asthmatic patients. But I, I believe, Dr. Han, you, you made a very good comment that I believe that we all, as in primary care, need to understand that not everybody has to be on a lava ICS. So no, not everybody needs to be on triple therapy. Because you see, the movement sometimes on us is to do that. I believe, like you said, if the patient is less symptomatic and is not having exacerbation, you said it very well, monotherapy may be just what they need, either a lama or lava by itself. And when people are becoming symptomatic and they're not having a lot of exacerbations, dual bronchodilators is a good option. And I believe that we in primary care needs to do a better job looking at those options, doing dual bronchodilator on people with no exacerbation, but are, that are symptomatic and are progressing on symptoms. And like you said, when people start to get sicker, they have more exacerbations. If we're going to use COP, you know, the, the, the triple therapy or the ICS with, with, a, with a lava, I believe that we should look into the eosinophil because if the eosinophils are very low, uh, you probably know that, Dr. Han, very well, those patients tend to not do well with inhaled corticosteroids. So we should not be considering you know, you know, triple therapy in those people, unless it's necessary for an exacerbation. So I believe that the new guidelines are bringing a, a change in the way we we're practicing in primary care. And hopefully, this presentation will help us in getting more comfortable on expanding our options to treat COPD. You know, I, I, I think try, figuring out where inhaled steroids sit is really confusing, but I, there is some really good data from some of the uh, triple therapy studies that I think help us to understand which patients really benefit most. And so I'd love to, with the last few minutes that we have here, kind of get into some of that if you want to move to the next slide for me. So there, there is some interesting um, data that we've been, uh, that has come in in the last year or so uh about things that might alter mortality in CPD. So this is a study from Peter Lindenauer's group. It was published in JAMA in 2020. And um, while this was not a randomized control trial, what they did was just to look at patients that have been hospitalized for COPD and those who did receive or did not receive pulmonary rehabilitation within 90 days after discharge. And what you can see here again in this observational study, but but really strong uh, differences in terms of 
uh, mortality at uh, one year for those who did receive pulmonary rehab. And I, I really love this data because it gives us some sense of, of the timing. When do we need to get patients into rehab after discharge to suggest that 90 days is an, is an important marker for that? Can we go to the next slide? So getting back to this question of, of inhaled steroids that, that Dr. Reyes and I have been, been chatting about, much of this data comes from two big studies that have been published within the last couple of years, uh, IMPACT, uh, which was published in 2018, and ETHOS, which was published just in 2020. And these triple therapy studies compared triple to each of the duals, uh, either dual bronchodilator or ics lava. But what is really important about this, and the, honestly, the biggest take home point is I want you to understand who the patients were that were in this study. Mean FEV1, both studies is around 43, 45%. And if you look, the majority of patients had two or more exacerbations in the prior year. Um, and, and even though we don't have it broken out here by severe, I can tell you a, a good portion also had, had severe. Um, these patients also um, were uh, highly symptomatic. The kind of rough mean score for CAT for both these studies was around 20. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, we can go ahead and look at the data. And what's most interesting here is the, um, uh, the impact on uh, both uh, exacerbations as well as death. So in this slide, we've got data on exacerbations. Uh, and uh, on the left is the data from ethos. Um, and here we can see the lowest rate of exacerbations in their triple therapy arm in green. And then for impact, their triple therapy arm, which again, inhaled corticosteroid lava llama is in gray. And again, lowest risk of exacerbations uh, in the triple therapy arm. So this is really behind that gold recommendation that we consider stepping up to triple therapy uh, when, when you know, exacerbations are really a concern. Now, if we go to the next slide, this is where we get into the, I think even more interesting data, because I think we all would have guessed the, the prior slides, but this is the more interesting data because neither of these studies really were necessarily designed to uh, have mortality as a primary endpoint. Uh, but interestingly, both showed a mortality benefit for triple therapy. So if we look at the ethos data on the left, the triple therapy arm is in green and we can see the lowest uh, rate of all cause deaths uh, against the other arms. And then in uh, the impact study, our triple therapy arm is in gray. And again, lowest mortality rate uh, for, for the gray arm. So you know, we, again, I don't actually think that necessarily either study group was expecting to be able to uh, see a mortality signal. But I think what it points to is that in patients that are appropriately selected for triple therapy, and again, these were patients with frequent exacerbations, low lung function, and high CAT scores, not only did they get exacerbation benefit, but they also uh, saw a mortality benefit from therapy. We want to go ahead and uh, move on to our next slide. So what are the key considerations in evaluating this mortality data? Um, uh, so these are, are, are just a, a couple of, of quotes from some various editorials that were done. Um, although it should be remembered that mortality was not the primary endpoint in both trials, that the data are important since previous large controlled trials failed to show a significant effect on mortality with inhaled therapy and CBD, even if compared to placebo. Uh, they also wrote reported mortality of both triple therapy studies fundamentally contribute to our understanding of the benefits of COPD. And it's time to concede that inhaled treatment not only has po uh, positive benefits on physiology, symptoms, and exacerbations, but also prognosis. Um, Nick, you know, uh, Jorgen Vespo states, I would rather ask why we keep looking for reasons why a proper pharmacological treatment in COPD should not lead to a reduction in mortality. In other words, why are we surprised? Why do we keep questioning this? And, and finally, given what we know about risk factors for mortality and multimorbidity in general, and COPD in particular, it really does not surprise me that these patients live longer. So, 
Um, I think it's been uh, maybe a little bit frustrating for uh, some of us, uh, you know, trying to to get this this message across and particularly into primary care that, you know, for me, the take home point here is what you do makes a difference. Choosing the right medication makes a difference. It can reduce exacerbations and you may be able to, uh, you know, make help these patients live longer. So I, I think it really just puts the onus back on us physicians to really think carefully and, and do the right thing. Can we move on to the next slide? So I do want to talk for a moment about oxygen therapy for COPD because this is also an important aspect of therapy for certain patients. And I think there has been some question over the years as to which patients are the right patients. Uh, but uh, in this uh, little excerpt from Gold, uh, the long-term administration of oxygen increases survival in patients with chronic resting arterial hypoxemia, in patients with stable COPD and moderate resting or exercise-induced arterial desaturation, uh, long-term oxygen does not lengthen time to death or first hospitalization. Resting oxygen at sea level does not exclude the development of severe hypoxemia when traveling. And finally, ventilatory support in, in terms of non-invasive may improve hospitalization-free survival in certain patients, particularly those with persistent hypercapnia. So let's, let's dig into this data a little bit more. So on the next slide, um, some of this change in practice uh, and, and uh, switch from, you know, all patients get oxygen regardless of whether it's resting or whether it's exercise induced desaturation to more of a, of a moderated statement saying that's important mostly in patients with persistent, uh, uh, even resting hypoxemia is data from the uh, uh, long-term oxygen therapy trial, which was an NIH sponsored initiative. Um, and, um, the, uh, sorry, let me just back up for a moment. So the long-term oxygen, long-term oxygen um, therapy does improve survival in patients with chronic resting hypoxemia. That's, that was shown in the original NOT study that was shown in, um, in the uh, original MRC. But if we have patients with just moderate resting or exercise induced, the more mild patients, the patients that just drop temporarily, those are the patients that the recent NIH-sponsored LOT study were able to show did not necessarily benefit. So the bottom line is if you have a patient with persistently low levels of oxygen, resting uh, saturations less than 88%, PO2 less than 55 all the time, those are the patients that definitely benefit. For me, any patient above that, we, we chat about it. There's not as much great data, but I'm not going to withhold it. Sometimes I'll go ahead and try it and see if the, the patient likes it. I, I find my patients really across the board. Some really love their oxygen, feel like it helps. Others um, others really would rather not bother with it and feel like it, it's, it's impeding their lifestyle. So, so I, I do allow for, I would say, some individualization of therapy for patients that are sort of in this in-between zone with more moderate resting or just exercise-induced hypoxia. For the patients with more severe hypoxia, I really do push them to be on oxygen therapy. If we could go on to the next slide. So the COPD uh, Foundation has something called the Oxygen 360 program. So Oxygen 360 is a new project aimed at modern, modernizing every aspect of oxygen therapy services. The focus is, promo is promoting innovative new technology to improve the quality of life for everyone in the oxygen community. And the COPD Foundation will work with equipment manufacturers, durable medical equipment suppliers and payers to develop practical and sustainable solutions that work for everyone. If you're curious and you want more information on this program and how it might be able to help your patients, you can find more at copdfoundation.org. So, uh, you know, in summary, if we want to go to the next slide, we, you know, what are the what are the take home uh, points here? We we know that COPD is prevalent. We know that there are huge unmet needs with respect to initial di uh, diagnosis and, and discordance between patients and providers in terms of, of what the needs are and how they're being met. We know spirometry is important, but it's not getting done uh, that. Uh, 
that the clinical impression for COPD diagnosis may not get everybody and, and that we really need to test. I think both the GOLD and the ATS uh, pharmacologic treatment frameworks are, are helpful. And, and to me, they're not really disparate. I think they just um, emphasize different nuances of things to think about. Uh, bronchodilator combination therapy really, to me, is a mainstay of COPD management. That is my initial, that, that is one of my go-tos, either single or dual bronchodilator therapy. Um, and then, you know, for some patients, you know, think about pulmonary rehabilitation early and often. We've talked about the data for triple therapy. It's more, it's more your frequent exacerbators, you're highly symptomatic. Um, but, you know, in the right patient group, it really can uh, benefit patients with respect to um, mortality reduction. Can we go on uh, to the next slide? Or maybe that's it. So I just really wanted to uh, thank everyone for taking the time to join us this evening. Thank you to Dr. Reyes for um, joining me uh, tonight. It was such a, a pleasure to get to work with him, even if virtually. I look forward to the next perhaps in-person conference where we can do this again. To our audience, thank you so much for joining us today. And, and please make sure you claim your CME credits by completing the post-test and evaluation forms at integrasite.com forward slash COPD post-test three. Um, I also just wanted to mention that um, there will be another opportunity to join me and Dr. Surya Bhatt on October 28th at 8 p.m. 8 p.m. Eastern for a live Twitter uh, Twitter ch uh, chat program. So I, you know, be excited to have you all join me for that as well. Um, thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your week. Good evening.